Hello everyone, uh, we'll be talking about uh, applying current practices uh, in perioperative analgesia, the options and alternatives today. My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh, I'm a consultant in anesthesia. I'm working at the University Hospitals Liverpool. I have nothing to declare. The images that I have used are courtesy Google, and uh, some of them are my own. I have no affiliation to any pharmaceutical companies. Optimal pain management need to be individualized and it need to be multimodal. That is, it should include all the five components of pain. That is a sensory component, cognitive component, psychological, social cultural and affective components. When we talk about acute pain management, we are actually thinking of one, that is the early recovery after surgery, and the second is prevention of complications. When we talk about ERAS, we are looking at discharging the patient early, whereas looking at prevention of complications, we are talking about the post persistent post-surgical pain, and chronic pain, prevention of these two components. There are a few terms which are used uh, when we talk about pain and uh, preventive analgesia is one of them. Preventive analgesia basically is combination of preemptive analgesia, that is analgesia which is delivered before the surgical incision, and multimodal analgesia that is used during the surgery and in the post-operative period. The World Health Organization has emphasized on using five phrases for correct use of analgesics, the first of which is by mouth. That is delivering the pain medication orally. Second is delivering this medication by the clock rather than on demand for at least for the first 48 to 72 hours. Then assessing and treating the pain appropriately using the WHO ladder. It does not mean that we have to go one step by the next. We can be on step three straight away. The patient might wake up with severe pain. That means we use a strong analgesic. We can also actually bypass the steps. So we might be on step one, but the simple analgesics didn't work and the pain became very severe, then we can move on straight on to the step three. And the analgesics need to be individualized. Everyone reacts and responds to pain in a different way. And hence the treatment should depend on that too. We need to pay attention to details. We need to be very uh, sure how we prescribe the medications, okay, and what we prescribe in it when they need to be administered, what time, for how long. And we also need to monitor its you know, effects. Are they really working? Okay. And are they create, uh, causing any side effects? We need to use adjuvants to improve analgesia and to minimize the side effects. We know that the opiates are associated uh, with nausea and vomiting and with constipation. So we should actually uh, prescribe patients anti and and maybe laxatives as well. Anti-inflammatories are important part of analgesia uh, management and they need to be prescribed into the post-operative period as well. Some patients might need psychotropic drugs to alleviate their anxiety, improve their sleep and mood, and it is also important part of analgesia management. So having introduced the management of acute pain broadly, we will now go into physiology of pain, where we'll discuss about the receptors involved, the primary afferent conduction, how it happens, how the integration of pain occurs in the dorsal horn, the ascending and descending pathways involved in pain, and the chemicals involved. So, the pain, the tissue injury, uh, all will induce the nociceptors. Okay? They will get activated. 
they get activated by heat, chemical pressure. Then, through the primary afferent, they reach the dorsal horn. These nociceptors are present in the skin, in the muscles, in the connective tissue, in blood vessels, in the viscera. So wherever we're going to have surgery, these all will be activated. And then they are transmitted to the dorsal horn. And there is also antidromic stimulation, uh, which causes release of certain substances like substance P, calcitonin gene-related peptides, that is CGRP, and neurokinase or neurokinin A. These substances then act on the tachykinin uh, receptors, which are present on the blood vessels and tissues. And this causes vasodilation and edema. And we would have observed that wherever there is tissue injury, the area around it is swollen as well as it's very sensitive. That sensitive, increased sensitivity happens because these substances, again, increase sensitization of the nociceptors. The primary afferent conduction occurs through A delta and C fibers and A beta fibers. The A delta and C fibers are the main fibers or the primary afferent fibers which conduct at a very high velocity at 0.5 to 15 meters per second. The C fibers are slow adaptive whereas the A delta fiber are fast adaptive fibers. And the C fibers, they conduct the slow, aching, diffuse, and dull pain. I call it sad pain. It's, it's a sad. It's a slow. It's aching. It is, it is diffuse. Okay. Whereas the A delta fibers tend to conduct the rapid pricking and well-localized pain. The integration of all this occur at the dorsal horn. So the nociceptive afferent fibers, the interneurons, and descending fibers converge at the dorsal horn. When a nociceptive signal comes in, there is increased conductance of calcium. You can actually see that on the right side of the fibers. This increased calcium conductance leads to release of glutamate and neuropeptides. On the projection neurons that you can actually see on the lower part, there is increased potassium conductance. This leads to depolarization of these neurons. The interneurons are usually inhibitory. They release enkephalin in normal situations. This is also the site uh, where the opiates will likely act. The neurotransmitters in the uh, descending pathways are norepinephrine and serotonin and enkephalin as well. I mean, that is through the into neurons, but also through the descending fibers, and we will actually discuss that in a little while. So the dorsal horn is actually, uh, you know, in uh, a uh, laminase, you know, the various laminae, one to six. And these are called Rax laminae. And we have seen that A beta fibers, uh, which also, uh, you know, interact, uh, there is actually a collateral going to the uh, uh, your C fibers in the lamina 2, that is the substantia gelatinosa. This is where the so called gate, so we talk, you know, about the uh, gate control theory where if you when you rub, so when you're rubbing it, that is the mechanoreceptors are activated through the A beta fibers. Then this actually goes and inhibit the transmission through the C fibers, and this is how the gate control theory actually works. So the pain is then transmitted uh, through the contralateral side, so the uh, ventrolateral part of the uh, spinal cord that transmits the pain through the spinal reticular system. And uh, from there, uh, it is uh, transmitted from the medulla uh, to the uh, brainstem reticular formation. That's why it's called a spinal reticular tract. And from there to the hypothalamus and then to the diffuse projection in this, to that, into this cortex. The other pathway is through the uh, spinothalamic tract, and this sends a collateral to the periatral, 
aqueductal gray, the PAG. This is a very, very important part in pain management. And then from there, it goes to thalamus, and that's why it is spinothalamic tract. And then from there to the postcentral gyrus. Okay. So that is the ascending pathway of pain. Now, if you look at the descending pathway, one important thing is that it is tonically active all the time. So, descending pathway, uh, which converge on the dorsal horn, is always active. And so, the fibers uh, from the cortex, from thalamus and hypothalamus, they pass through the midbrain. Uh, that's where the pre aqueductal gray matter is present. And this is this is where uh, your opiate actually act. We also saw from the ascending pathway that there was a collateral from the smilothalamic tract. So the integration of those ascending pathway, transmission of the nociceptive, uh, you know, responses occur uh, also occur at the periaqueductal grape. From the PAG, uh, the uh, you know, this, this transmission occurs to, uh, to the medulla uh, at two places. One is the nucleus raphe magnus, or NRM, and the locus cerulus, or LC. Now, both of these have a dis different transmitters at the dorsal horn, because these project to the dorsal horn as the descending uh, pathways. Okay. So, the fibers from the NRM, they uh, use uh, encaphalin and uh, fire doxytryptamine that is serotonin as the neurotransmitters, whereas the fibers from the locus cerulus actually use norepinephrine. Okay. So there are different, different neurotransmitters involved in modulation of pain at the dorsal horn. So if we look at the descending brainstem neurons, and uh, they uh, you know, have direct action to prevent pain. They can in Inhibition, they can cause inhibition of excitatory neurons. Or they might excite the inhibitory interneurons, which are again inhibitory uh, on the primary afferents. So there are three different ways in which uh, the descending brainstem neurons can modulate pain uh, at the dorsal horn level. So what we were talking about till now is the somatic pain. But the Visceral pain is different. One thing about visceral pain is that there is relative deficiency of A delta nerve fibers. Okay, so the pain is not that well localized in cases of the visceral pain, it's poorly localized. And it is also associated with nausea and vomiting and autonomic disturbances. The pain is usually spasmodic and it is often referred to the somatic structures and the pain is elicited by distension of the viscera, ischemia, and inflammation. So these three things are important. So you can actually cut the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what do you call the gut without causing any pain. So sharp pain is not actually, uh, you know, transmitted uh, through the viscera. It is because there is no uh, a delta fibers that there or there is paucity of the A delta fibers. So what are the neurotransmitters uh, which are involved? I talked about some of them. So when uh, we actually have a uh, tissue injury, uh, there is increased release of potassium. And this is very important because this potassium directly depolarizes the nerve terminal and makes the nociceptive more responsive. So there is increased sensitization. There is release of bradykinin, 5-hydroxytryptamine, that is serotonin. And also prostaglandins, which I will again talk in a minute. Now there is also antidromic transmission, uh, which releases substance P and CGRP, that is the calcitonin gene-related peptide, which acts on the mast cells and cause decarinulation and release of histamine. The CGRP and substance P also acts on the blood vessels, on the tachykinin receptors and cause vasodilation, and the edema which ensues 
from uh, this vasodilation in the tissues. When there is a surgical insert, there is a rupture of the cell membrane. This releases arachidonic acid, and we know that this is important for release of the prostaglandins. These prostaglandins G2 and H2 uh, also cause nociceptor activation and peripheral sensitization. And this is the area where our non-steroidal cycle will work. Okay. So that was about the physiology of pain. And now what about the pharm pharmacology of uh, pain management? So the main components of pain management are opiate and non-opiate drugs. So we'll talk about these because these are very important for us. And the foremost nociceptive drugs or antinociceptive drugs are opioids. Now opioid receptors are present in the spinal cord. They are present in the periaqueductal grade, the PAG in the midbrain. They're present centrally in the amygdala, in the medulla, in the cortex. So when we use opioids, they cause disruption of information transmission in the nociceptive circuit. Okay. So if you look at the right side, as I explained, when the nociceptive stimulus comes in, there is, there is conductance of calcium. Calcium moves in to the cells. Okay. And this causes release of the neuropeptides and glutamate. And this, is, this happens through the, the voltage-gated calcium channels. So the, the opiates reduce or decrease conductance by acting on this voltage gated uh, so calcium channels. And therefore there is decreased transmission. At the same time, at the projection neurons, that is in the lower part, you can see it. They cause increased inward movement of potassium. And this causes hyperpolarization. So there is decreased conduction of impulses as well. Okay. So there is reduced amount of the neurotransmitters being released, as well as hyperpolarization, which even if there is some amount of release, this signals will won't be transmitted through the projection neurons because there is hyperpolarization. So from this diagram, we can actually see that the opiates act at the cortical level and the thalamus and in the amygdala in the cortex, it acts on the midbrain at the periaqueductal grade, that is PAG. They act in the medulla, in the rostroventral medulla, the RVM, and at the spinal cord in the dorsal column at the neuro, uh, the interneuron level. So, opiates receptors are present uh, in the various parts of the central nervous system. This is a simplified diagram explaining how the opiate works centrally. Right, so they decrease the nociceptive information processing. So by acting on the cortex or at the amygdala level, okay, the perception is changed. There is a feel good component with opiates. The patient feel feel nice. Feel, <laughs> there is euphoric effect of opiate seen. At the spinal level, uh, they block the afferent dissociative uh, inputs, and and they also actually enhance descending inhibition. So through the uh, pyroxyl tryptamine, uh, through the encephalin and the release of norepinephrine at the dorsal horn, they enhance the descending inhibition so that the, the nociceptive stimulus are not transmitted further through the ascending pathway. They also have a cholinergic effect as well. So you can actually see opiate acts through acetylcholine as well at the uh, thalamus level, okay, at the central level. So the inhibitory actions uh, on the brain stem leads to decrease in arousal. So this is where the sedation effect occurs from morphine. So morphine does cause sedation, isn't it? At the same time, we know that sympathetic stimulation causes tachycardia, release of, you know, the... Uh, Color means and uh, so this uh, effect uh, through the cholinergic input on the SN node causes bradycardia and thus mitigates the sympathetic response to nociception. So it acts uh, there as well.
Now, opiates can be uh, you know, taken orally. Uh, we can uh, give them intravenously. We can use spinal opiates. Uh, we can use them epidurally. So we're now looking into uh, you know, the, what is the evidence base. Uh, so the first one is looking at patient control analgesia, where the patient can deliver opiates to themselves, or nurse control analgesia, that happens in the uh, like the intensive care units or the cardiac intensive care units. So they looked at, looked at 10 randomized controlled trials uh, between the PCA and NCA, and they found that the there is reduced uh, VAS scores at 48 hours, but not at 24 hours. And not surprisingly, there is increased cumulative. Uh, morphine consumption at 24 hours because patients are happily, you know, pressing the button to get their uh, morphine in anticipation sometimes, uh, you know. But there is no difference uh, between the patient control analgesia or nurse control analgesia in terms of the ICU length of stay, length of stay in the hospital, uh, patient satisfaction, sedation score, incidence of nausea and vomiting respiratory depression and other effects. So there is no much difference. In the Cochrane review on patient control analgesia, uh, they looked at uh, around 55 studies with uh, large numbers, uh, 2023 receiving PCA and 1838 patients receiving uh, the nurse control analgesia. Again, PCA provided better pain control and greater patient satisfaction. There was obviously increased consumption of opiates, but there was increased incidence of pruritus. But there was no difference in length of hospital stay, whether it was patient control or nurse control analgesia. So what about the epidural opioid? I mean, we use that very commonly. It's used in abdominal surgeries. It is used in uh, obstetrics. So this, they were looking at the abdominal aortic surgeries. And they looked at 15 trials, uh, large numbers, 297 patients, uh, 633 received epidural, and uh, 664 received systemic opioids, so the IV or PC opioids. The epidural uh, group obviously showed significant lower uh, RAS scores for pain on movement. And this was obviously seen up to three days. That is, the catheter obviously was kept for three days. So it provides better pain relief, and uh, also uh, if there were uh, epidural was used, then uh, there was uh, early uh, tracheal extubation. And uh, as far as uh, the uh, prolonged postoperative mechanical ventilation, myocardial infarction, gastric complication, uh, or renal complication, these were all reduced by epidural analgesia. Again, in a Cochrane review, looking at epidural local anesthetic versus opiate-based regimens. Again, this is seen in, in abdominal surgery aid study. Uh, there were a small number of patients, but what they concluded was that, yes, there was reduced time of uh, GI functions. That is, uh, GI function return earlier. There was slight reduction in VOS scores, but there is no significant difference in the post of nausea vomiting or other complication of abdominal surgeries. So they seem to actually say that there is not much difference between the epidurals and the PCA. So next one, again, a Cochrane database review about continuous epidural analgesia. Uh, looked at blind randomized controlled trial compared with IV PCA. And they suggested that the continuous epidural analgesia had better pain control in the first 72 hours. But there was no difference in the length of stay or adverse event between the two routes. And epidural opioids were, were actually causing more pruritus uh, in the patients. There was reduced postoperative pain and ileus, but there was increased incidence of pruritus, hypertension, and neuroretention in the epidural anesthesia group uh, in corrected surgeries. And this may be the reason why epidural analgesia is not part of the ERAS for colorectal surgery. 
they do use spinal opiates, single dose, but they don't actually use uh, continuous epidural analgesia and colorectal surgery when it is part of the ERAS. So what about uh, use of intrathecal morphine? So the patients actually get intrathecal morphine intraoperatively and the postoperative get a pain, PCA morphine. So these are two groups. So both groups are getting PCA, but one group was also receiving intrathecal morphine. So what was the difference? And this was for major abdominal surgery in 60 patients. And they saw that analgesia at rest and while coughing was better in patients who had intrathecal morphine and PCA on the first post-operative day. And there's no surprise to this because intrathecal morphine provide analgesia, very good analgesia, eh, for the duration of the time it acts. That is the first uh, anywhere from 18 to 24 hours. And again, not surprising, morphine consumption was lower in the intrathecal morphine group in the first post-operative day, but it was going to be no different in the second post-operative day. Nausea and vomiting uh, were more frequent with intrathecal morphine because you have delivered morphine directly into the spinal cord, and they were using PCA morphine as well. So the incidence was much higher in the first post-operative day. Uh, for the nausea and vomiting. Uh, there were no incidence of respiratory depression and satisfaction was high in both groups. This is seen in uh, any PCA group. It's not surprising at all. When patients are given the control for their own pain relief, the satisfaction always seemed uh, to be higher. So that was about opiates, uh, whether they were systemic opiates or uh, intrathecal opiates or epidural opiates. So that is the evidence base in that. Next we come with, to the most commonly used non-opiate analgesic that is paracetamol or acetaminophen. So how does the paracetamol work? So the analgesic effect is considered to be because of the indirect activation of the cannabinoid receptor that is CB1. Acetaminophen, that is paracetamol, which we take orally, is metabolized in the liver to paraminophenol. And it's in, uh, it's in conjugate, uh, conjugated form. It forms the n arachnodonyl uh, phenolamine, uh, which is an endogenous cannabinoid. This NAPA is agonist at the uh, transient receptor protein, uh, uh, the venoloid one, okay, TPRV1, and inhibition of cellular anandamide uptake occurs uh, by this, and this leads to increased levels of endogenous cannabinoids. So basically, the analgesic effect is a is indirect activation of cannabinoid uh, receptors uh, at the brain level. The paracetamol also seems to inhibit prostaglandin synthesis of the uh, prostaglandin H2. But this occurs in the brain where there is high concentration of fatty acid amide hydro hydrolase, the FAH. This doesn't have any anti-inflammatory effect, so this is not happening at the tissue level. So there are acetaminophen even though uh, it inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis, but this is happening at central level. This is not happening at the peripheral level. So the, the analgesic effect of paracetamol is a direct analgesic effect and also by the modulation effect. Okay. So there is uh, anandamide reuptake inhibition, which increases uh, the uh, you know, central uh, cannabinoid or, or endogenous cannabinoid uh, CB1 increase. So what is the evidence uh, behind acetaminophen? Um, does it really work? Uh, so this is from the Cochrane Review. Uh, 51 studies, large number of patients, 5,762 patients, uh, of which 3,277 uh, 3, in the active group and 2,425 2, in the placebo group. So there's 50% reduction in pain and uh, the number needed to treat with uh, 
one gram or five gram is around 3.5 to 3.6. And uh, compared to the placebo, only 50% of the paracetamol uh, group required additional analgesia, whereas it was 70% in the placebo group. What is more important is that 21 studies looked at the paracetamol alone or in combination and obviously found that there is increased efficacy of the combination that is when paracetamol is used along with other agents. Paracetamol is, is used intravenously and uh, uh, what is important to see is that uh, uh, this was actually now uh, we looked at uh, studies in orthopedic surgery, laminectomy, subdominal, gynecology, cardiac, cardiac and thyroid administration. And what was seen is that uh, uh, IV paracetamol improved patient satisfaction and it lowers uh, morphine consumption by almost 61%, which is significant. It also decreases the incidence of vomiting. And it's important to, to actually uh, notice, to see this, that there's no statistical difference in the rates of adverse event, including uh, the liver function abnormalities as compared to placebo. So IV paracetamol, if you use in the right dose at the right time, that is one gram IV every six hourly, so you do not exceed more than four grams in 24 hours, is pretty safe. Now, there, this is a very recent paper, actually, rather this was actually released uh, just uh, this month, and they are talking about fixed dose combination. Paracetamol is available, uh, you know, in a fixed dose combination along with tremadol, codeine, and oxycodone. And I will actually discuss this in a little bit more detail because uh, this has great implications uh, in the management of post-operative pain. Tremadol with paracetamol has been available for a very long time as uh, tremacet. Next, we come to two important drugs, ketamine and magnesium sulfate. Uh, both of these are NDA receptor blockers, work in a slightly different way. And we know that glutamate is the primary excitatory uh, neurotransmitter in the nervous system. So when the depolarization of C fibers occur, it releases uh, glutamate. That is, there is increased conduction of calcium, which causes the release of glutamate, which acts on the NMDA receptor or an AMP receptor. And uh, when there is depolarization, and uh, if this depolarization continues, then there's activation of the NMDA receptors. And uh, this can lead to increased calcium conductance uh, into the uh, dorsal horn, uh, which is shown, shown on the right side. And this can lead to central sensitization, hyperalgesia, allotenia. So that's very, very important that uh, the NMD receptors are not activated. So we, uh, you know, use the drugs like ketamine and magnesium to block the NMD receptors. So ketamine obviously blocks the, uh, the PCP uh, receptors, uh, the fencyclidine receptors, whereas magnesium physically actually blocks the channels, the NMD channels. Yeah, and, the, and thus there is no transmission. They reduce the transmission uh, of the nociceptive inputs. So ketamine, that's how ketamine acts peripherally uh, at the, uh, uh, you know, the dorsal horn level. It will cause the blocking of the nociceptive receptors into the spinal cord. Ketamine acts centrally and uh, it's, uh, there are NMD receptors present in the cortex and uh, also at the spinal level. So the right side diagram actually shows that. So these are at uh, gaminergic uh, receptors. The interneurons are stimulated by ketamine and magnesium centrally as well as peripherally. Okay. So ketamine and magnesium work in similar way. So at uh, low doses, uh, also there is uh, stimulation of these receptors. Uh, but with low doses, there is less amount of sedation as compared to the high doses. High doses can actually cause profound unconsciousness uh, because 
we know that the uh, all our agents like benzodiazepines and barbiturates, they work at the gabonergic receptors, so does ketamine. So they call, can cause sedation, and we know that it can be used as induction agent in there. So what is the, so the, the evidence base for ketamine, uh, intravenous ketamine? Uh, so systematic review of 70 studies, 4,700 patients, uh, 2,652 in ketamine group, 2,049 placebo group. And they've seen that there is a reduction in total opiate consumption. And the, there is increase in time for the first analgesic requirement by the patients. And this, this is statistically significant. And it has been seen to be efficacious in thoracic, upper abdominal, major orthopedic surgeries. And, um, and obviously, I mean, the 78% of the patients tend to have experienced less pain than the uh, placebo uh, group in patients who receive uh, ketamine. There's obviously a problem with uh, things like hallucination and nightmares which are associated with ketamine, and these can occur uh, without increasing the sedation level. One of the advantages, other advantages of using ketamine as the adjuvant in pain management is that it causes less amount of nausea and uh, vomiting in patient. The other important thing is that the analgesic effect of ketamine is independent of the type of intraoperative opiate use. It does not matter what opiate you use, whether you use pantalinol, you use ketamine, you use remifantil, it does not matter. Other thing is the time of uh, ketamine administration and the dose use have are totally independent uh, on the analgesic effect. So you can actually give ketamine uh, before incision, you can take use interoperatively, use, and, and the dose used as well. So you can actually use low dose uh, ketamine infusion throughout. So even using like 25 to 50 milligrams of ketamine before the incision actually have a marked effect on the uh, requirement for analgesic in the post-operative period. I like to say magnesium is another uh, agent which is available to all of us. It also acts through the NMDA receptors and it's a very good adjuvant uh, for reducing uh, the uh, dose for anti nociceptive agents. So it reduces the requirement for opiates and other analgesics. And it can act centrally as well, and uh, in high doses, you need to be very careful. Uh, uh, don't use doses like used in the eclampsia patients, uh, because it can cause uh, decrease in uh, AV conduction, and it can lead to heart blocks and uh, in some patients with cardiac arrest. It does potentiate uh, uh, sedation, so uh, using it too late into the surgery, uh, with the residual effect, you can actually have slow uh, awakening uh, in the post-operative period. The other group of agents which are very important are the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Uh, these are dexmedetomidine and clonidine. Uh, in India, dexmedetomidine is easily available, uh, whereas for us, it is actually a very costly drug. Uh, so we tend to actually use clonidine, which is a cheaper drug, um, so, clonidine and dexamethamidine uh, obviously act centrally as well as peripherally. Uh, peripherally, they act at the spinal cord level in the dorsal horn, and uh, centrally, they act in the cortex and uh, in the, uh, in the you know, uh, midbrain as well. So, they activate the inhibitory interneurons and thus enhance the uh, descending inhibition of nociceptive uh, transmission. Uh, they can also act presynaptically uh, pre to decrease the release of norepinephrine uh, centrally, and this is what causes the sedation effect of dexmedetomidine and clonidine. So both of them are associated with sedation. So what does the evidence actually tell us? What about the uh, you know the uh, meta-analysis and randomized controlled trials? What has been seen that uh, alpha-2 agonists, they provide a moderate amount of analgesia. They may be better than paracetamol, 
but not better than ketamine or non-steroidals. So they are oh, very good as part of the multimodal analgesia, but on their own, uh, they may not be better than, than ketamine and non-steroidal. The other problem associated uh, with use of dexmedomidin as a single agent is they can cause uh, severe hypertension and bradycardia. And hence, dexmedomidin has often been used along with ketamine and other agents. Dexcat is a, a very popular uh, you know, combination uh, used by many. So the meta-analysis uh, and RCD also actually talk about the extra analgesic benefits of using uh, uh, these alpha-2 agonists. Uh, that they are very good sedatives, so uh, they're, they're good for using in day case uh, you know, procedures where sedation is required. Um, they cause angiolysis, they provide analgesia, they reduce post-op shivering, reduce the post-op nausea and vomiting agitation. They also mitigate the stress response to surgery and tracheal intubation and obviously have anesthetic sparing effects. So if you're using it uh, during interoperative period, you can reduce the amount of the profile or the world anesthetic use. They can also be used along with the uh, local anesthetic as part of the neuraxial and peripheral nerve blocks. And in very high risk uh, vascular patients, they have been shown to decrease perioperative mortality and myocardial infarction. I think this may be related to their effect <coughs> on the heart rate. You can see pericardia that causes. So slow heart rates are very good uh, in these patients. Next up, the non steroids and lignocaine. Uh, uh, these two agents are available to everyone. Uh, they're easy to use and provide uh, very good analgesia. Yeah. So when surgical insert occurs, there is disruption of the cell membrane, uh, there is release of arachidonic acid, and this leads to production of prostaglandin in G2 and H2. And uh, this is where the non steroidal acts. At the same time, uh, the surgical insert causes cellular inflammatory response. There is activation of mast cells, which release histamine, and these histamines actually cause activation of the polynuclear uh, cells. And it is this is where uh, the lignocaine actually works. The lignocaine blocks the neutrophil priming. And neutrophils, activated neutrophils are involved in amplifying the inflammatory response. So local anesthetic acts as anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, so they cause... Uh, uh, down regulation of the neutrophil degeneration. Uh, so fantastic agents to use, easy to use as well. And this I have already explained to you in the uh, earlier diagram the, the, how uh, the agents released uh, the various amount of the uh, neurotransmitters and uh, you know released uh, when there is uh, tissue injury. So we know that uh, non-steroidals can uh, be specific and non-specific. Uh, uh, non-specific, uh, for example, the diclofenac, uh, ibuprofen, uh, where the specific are uh, the COX uh, inhibitors. And uh, they have anti-nociceptive and anti-inflammatory effect uh, because they prevent the formation of prostaglandins, uh, which are involved in, in the uh, peripheral sensitization so looking at uh, the evidence base, and they've seen that single dose oral ibuprofen, uh, this was uh, looked at in the 72 randomized controlled trial, a uh, huge number of patients, 9,168 9, patients. Uh, there is more than 50% pain relief uh, uh, in patients with moderate to severe post-operative pain. And uh, the ad, uh, there were no increased adverse events. They were similar to placebo. So, Non-selective, non steroids like ibuprofen are commonly, we use them in most of our cases in the post-operative period. Uh, coming to salicoxib, which is a selective uh, inhibitor. And uh, this looked at 10 studies, uh, 1,785 patients. 
And so, so dose of 400 milligrams is actually better. And uh, the time to rescue medication is markedly increased compared to the placebo. And uh, the requirement for rescue medication is also markedly reduced is 63% as compared to 91% in placebo group. And the adverse uh, events were mild to moderate in all groups. There was no difference in the frequency between the placebo group or the uh, selective NSAID groups. Obviously, recently there have been issues about that, uh, you know, the use of uh, uh, these non sterols can cause uh, heart disease and uh, they use but that is again for long term where patients and we're not talking here about long term use uh, in post op period we're talking about use for around maybe uh, uh, initially 72 hours and later on um, using them as and when required injectable non sterol ketorolac has fallen uh, uh, out of uh, you know use uh, we don't use as much uh, but uh, these uh, there are studies looking at its analgesic efficacy and uh, they tend to reduce opiate consumption by almost 30 percent and they facilitate quicker recovery and rehabilitation now, some places are still using uh, lower doses of ketorolac but higher doses in elderly patients and patients who are dehydrated you need to be very careful Ibuprofen, uh, injectable ibuprofen is available in U.S. and it has seen that a dose of 800 milligram uh, reduces morphine consumption by 22% in the first 24 hours. And there is significant reduction in pain at rest and with movement. As far as adverse drug uh, reaction are concerned, there is no significant increase as compared to placebo. So another drug uh, for orthopedic and abdominal surgeries and other surgeries. Lignocaine, one of our new favorites, uh, we all use it for uh, regional anesthesia. We know that it blocks this uh, sodium channel. And, uh, uh, same thing actually helps uh, as well uh, in the management of pain. So when we actually use lignocaine as infusion, I've already explained that, that basically uh, we know that tissue injury uh, leads to priming of the neutrophils, which are degranulated, and this degranulation causes amplification and inflammatory response. And it has been seen that lignocaine, uh, when used at very low concentrations, are able to block this neutrophil priming, and hence there is uh, down regulation of neutrophil degranulation and hence reduction of the inflammatory response. So. Uh, lignocaine is actually helping in uh, reducing the nociceptive recept, uh, you know, responses as well as uh, uh, causing the anti-inflammatory response. It has also been now recently realized that uh, sodium channels, uh, lignocaine not only blocks the sodium channels, but it also acts on an, an MDA receptors. So this acts at the uh, glycine receptors in the brainstem and uh, amygdala, so the cortex, and uh, diminishes nociceptive transmission and can also lead to a bit of sedation. Okay, so the central effects of lignocaine have been realized as well. So what does the evidence say? Meta-analysis after abdominal surgeries, uh, they looked at eight trials, 161 patients received lignocaine, uh, 159 received just saline. And both patients were allowed to use opiates as and when required. What they found in the Lignic and IV group that there is decreased duration of alias, there is reduction in the length of stay in the hospital, the reduction in the post-operative pain intensity, reduction in the incidence of post-op nausea and vomiting, and 30 to 50 percent reduction in opioid consumption. Now that is a significant reduction, 30 to 50 percent, just with use of lignocaine. That's really good. In another systematic review, uh, looking at various surgeries uh, like abdominal, tonsillectomy, total hip, and coronary artery bypass. Now I want you to actually look at this very closely because this has got, uh, you know, greater implication. So 16 trials. 395 patients received lignocaine, 369 received saline. And again, all could receive opiates as required. 
So in patients who receive IV lidocaine, pain score will reduce at rest and with cough or movement uh, up to 48 hours postoperatively in abdominal surgery patients. So this is excellent because abdominal surgery, uh, coughing and movement, um, these are important uh, to prevent you know, respiratory complications which are associated with, especially with upper abdominal surgery. But there was no impact on postoperative analgesia in patients undergoing tonsillectomies, total hips, or coronary artery bypass graft. So in these surgeries, actually there is probably not much effect of the IV lidocaine. It did reduce the duration of ileus, uh, length of hospital stray, uh, post-story pain density was uh, reduced, there was less incidence of post of nausea vomiting. And there was absolutely 85 reduction in opiate consumption in the you know, abdominal surgery cases. Now that is again very, very significant. Okay, so use it guys, use it. This is something which is very useful for people who do not have access to opioids. Okay. Now, lignocan and other local anesthetic can also be used for wound infiltration. Again, and these are important and they were actually seem to be useful in cardiothoracic, abdominal, gynecological, colorectal, head and neck, and orthopedic surgeries. So there is uh, no uh, increased incidence of infection or toxicity um, in any of these uh, clinical situations. And this is again very, very important that using it preoperatively, so blocking preoperatively is superior to using it postoperatively. So if you want to infiltrate the wound, infiltrate it before the incision. The infiltration after the end or at the end of surgery actually is not that effective. And pain is reduced both at rest and at mobilization, which is actually fantastic. And like I already explained, there is almost 85% reduction in opioid requirement when uh, you use uh, IV lignocaine. And uh, with wound infiltration, again, uh, there is uh, a significant reduction in opioid. And in uh, breast surgery, uh, breast cancer surgeries, it was seen. One study sees that they decrease uh, occurrence of acute and chronic pain at three and six months after the surgery. Now you need to be careful when you're using IV lignocaine uh, as infusion, and then you want to use other local anesthetic for wool infiltration. You need to be careful with the uh, drug toxicity. So you do not want to exceed the total uh, safe limits for uh, the local anesthetic and here local anesthetic is not individual it's combined it is not a individual drug dose the other group of agents uh, which are used as part of the preemptive analgesia are GAB analogs so we know that benzodiazepine and barbiturates act on GABA receptors they increase the chloride uh, in a conductance and uh, that's how they work. Uh, but there are two agents, gabapentin and uh, pregabalin, uh, which act through the GABA B receptors. Uh, they act on to the voltage uh, directed calcium channels. They inhibit uh, conductance of calcium. And these have been used uh, uh, for a while. Now, gabapentinoids in April last year in UK have been classified as class C controlled substance. So they are similar to your opioid prescription. So this is to reduce the abuse of gabapentin and pregabalin. Okay. So what does the systematic, uh, systematic reviews tell about that? So uh, the gabapentin was seen in 22 trials, uh, 1,640 patients. Uh, pregabalin eight trials in 707 patients. So gabapentin does provide better post-operative analgesia. Uh, it helps in sparing uh, rescue analgesics as compared to placebo. And these are uh, administered, like I said, these are part of preemptive analgesia. We tend to administer this in the preoperative period. Rather, uh, some of them uh, start this pregabalin or gabapentin 
uh, one or two days before uh, this uh, day of surgery. Now, 14 of the 20 trials, 14 randomized controls trials says that carbapentin did not reduce uh, post of nausea and vomiting as has been uh, previously advocated. Uh, looking at pregabalin, it says it also provides better post-operative analgesia as compared to placebo. But four studies reported no pregabalin effect of preventing post of nausea and vomiting. So, carbapentin and pregabalin, they do not actually have much effect on prevention of post of nausea and vomiting. And the reduction in opiate consumption is about 30%, so not as good as lignocaine. I will ignore again, but it does actually they do help, so they should be part of the multimodal analysis. Yeah, no harm in using that. So that was the basics of the uh, you know pain management. So we're talking about the physiology, pharmacology. Next, we will like look at the practical approach with some examples. And so the first is a case of lab coli in a 38 year old woman. And uh, she wants to discuss uh, post-operative analgesia uh, because her experience has not been good in the past uh, when she had ambulatory laparoscopic gynecological procedure. So one thing we need to remember, pain management is more than just use of these pharmacological agents or nerve blocks. We need to align the expectations of the patient. We need to be realistic about the pain. You cannot actually tell the patient that there'll be no pain at all, because if you tell them, and then patient actually has pain in the post-operative period, it is going to cause disappointment, and that can also lead to fear and anxiety that something might have gone wrong. That's why patient is feeling pain. So it's important to align the expectations. We need to plan and educate the patient. We need to educate the patient about the degree of pain expected. We need to discuss how we are going to assess pain in the post-operative period and how we're going to manage this pain based on this assessment. We need to reduce the anxiety, patient anxiety, okay, by explaining what their expectation is going to be what can happen why things can go wrong or why the patients despite giving appropriate analgesia why patient might still feel pain so it's important to communicate their analgesic rate it is important to tell them that breathing exercises coughing ambulation and post-operative rehabilitation are important part of the whole package. There are going to be, you know, incisions or port sites just below the ribs. Uh, taking deep breaths can initiate pain. Coffee can initiate pain. Okay. And if possible, patients should be provided information in form of leaflets. They need to be told that they can be, I mean, this is obviously communicated mostly by the surgeons, that there may be a small chance that the laparoscopic surgery might uh, convert into an open surgery. And when this happens, they're going to be pain associated with the incision. They can be visceral pain. And then they can be referred pain to the shoulder. Okay, so patient might think, oh, I didn't actually have any surgery on the shoulder. Why am I having this pain? They need to be told that the use of analgesia and as a part of the surgery, these patients can have sickness. When patient is actually having nausea, vomiting, retching, that itself can cause pain. Okay, And they need to be told that we will actually uh, give prophylaxis and that they would be actually uh, written up for antiemetics in the post-operative period and that we will actually recess them and treat them accordingly. So again, the uh, risk assessment starts from the preoperative period. Depending on the risk score, you will actually use prophylaxis and you will uh, prescribe appropriate antiemetics. When the patients are discharged to the ward, you need to make sure that they are prescribed appropriate medications for managing pain and managing nausea and vomiting as well. 
And if there are going to be day cases, they need to again be actually told what medications they need to take, at what time need to take, for how long they need to take these medications. And if they have complications of use of this medication, nausea and vomiting, that they are written up for the, the medications uh, for nausea and vomiting as well. They need to be told when they will be followed up and if the complication occurs, what they need to do, okay, who they need to contact. So the, all these are very, very important, okay. So as we look at the uh, era, so this uh, situation was basically about uh, early recovery after surgery. And if there is inadequate pain management in these patients, this can increase the stay in the recovery period. Like a patient wakes up with pain, they get uh, opioids or other medications, they can become sick. That increases this, uh, the uh, length of stay in the recovery. And sometimes, that instead of uh, the day case, they become inpatient because of this persistent nausea and vomiting or pain. So this will increase the length of stay uh, in the hospital. And this will lead to unanticipated hospital admission because patient came as day case, and now you need to arrange a bed for the patient to at least stay in the hospital. And again, obviously, the whole idea of the early uh, recovery from after surgery is to get back patient to their daily living function. So this is delayed as well. And obviously, all this lead to decreased patient satisfaction because their expectation was that they will get home the same evening. They will be able to actually start doing the activities they normally do from day one. So you have not met their expectation. So pain management is very, very important part of the ambulatory surgery. So in brief, we need to look at the ERAS uh, is about intraoperative multimodal analgesia. It is about pre-op preparation, information, and education. I call it PI. Okay. You give them a piece of pie. Okay, you prepare them for what they are going through. You give them information. You educate them. Post-op management of pain and its side effects are important. The instructions uh, for the post-op management of pain are equally important, and so is the follow-up. And there are social cultural issues associated with pain. Some patients may not be able to get back to the normal because they do not actually have support at home. So you need to also look at that. So we come to the second case. Second case is a 60 year old man. where He's got a history of smoking and uh, he also has COPD and is now scheduled for thoracotomy uh, for removal of carcinoma in the right middle lobe. So this patient is going to have a thoracotomy. Why is this important? This is important because this is a surgery that is associated with persistent post-surgical pain. So incidence of the post persistent post-surgical pain in thoracotomy is 5 to 67 percent. In mastectomy, 11 to 57 percent. Cholestectomy, 3 to 56 percent. So there are actually various surgery, even simple surgeries, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, varicose vein surgery, cesarean section, hysterectomy, these are associated with persistent post surgical pain between 12 to 27 percent. So, management of post persistent post surgical pain is about preventing peripheral sensitization of primary hyperalgesia. We actually have seen that tissue injuries cause the release of arachidonic acid, there is prostaglandin synthesis, there is nociceptor uh, receptor activation. And there is peripheral, uh, you know, sensitization and hyperalgesia, which causes pain. So if you actually manage the acute pain very well, then it won't, uh, uh, you know, lead to the chronic pain. Because as if the intense and, uh, and there is intense and prolonged noxious transmission uh, within the uh, pain system, that will actually cause, cause uh, chronic pain. So uh, this patient is having a, a thoracic surgery, uh, so we have major goals. Uh, one thing is obviously the pulmonary function will be impaired uh, because of the surgery itself and uh, the lung reduction. And uh, uh, there will also be worsening effect of pain, uh, uh, splinting and atelectasis uh, happening because of the splinting. And uh, 
Then again, a worse sedation for analgesics uh, can also promote respiratory depression and atelectasis because that causes shallow breathing, uh, which leads to atelectasis. So uh, the early post-operative period, we need to actually optimize and balance uh, the pain control, and we need to maintain the pulmonary function. So, you know, deep breathing. So this patient is having a surgery in the in the chest, the thoracotomy. Uh, and you want patients to breathe, uh, take deep breaths, and, and this itself leads to pain. So if you don't actually have uh, enough uh, pain relief or good pain relief, uh, then patient will won't be taking uh, deep breaths, which will cause splinting atelectasis, and because patient won't be breathing enough, won't be able to cough, uh, this leads to respiratory complications. So preoperative planning is important. Okay, you need to actually tell them how you are going to assess the pain in these patients, uh, what are the realistic expectations about intensity and duration of post-operative pain? Uh, we'll have discussions about whether, you know, which is good for this patient. Can they have a thoracic epidural or PCA? Okay. And uh, what are the resources available to us to prevent chronic pain? And, you know, because if the pain goes beyond their expectation duration, then this can lead to persistent post-surgical pain and chronic pain. So we need to discuss that. So we need to make patients aware uh, what they are going to expect after surgery. They need to understand what the procedure involves, what is their realistic expectation of pain or rehabilitation. And you need to also make them show that, yes, there can be severe uh, acute post-operative pain, uh, which can progress to post-surgical pain, but we can take care of it. Okay, we have got the means of taking care of it. So the thoracic epidural is a mainstay uh, of the recommended therapy, but sometimes the epidurals can fail or they can be patchy. In that case, we can actually give them intercostal nerve blocks, we can give them parietal block, we can give erectospinal block. And again, these blocks can be used as a bridge for immediate post-operative uh, pain relief. And also we can actually use it you know, uh, to uh, bridge it till we actually reinsert the epidural. So we can, epidurals can be replaced. If they're not working properly, they can be replaced. Or we can actually insert intercostal catheters or parietal catheters can be placed or erectospinal block catheters can be actually also placed as alternative strategies for pain management. Then there are actually pain uh, which are not associated uh, directly with the surgery. Uh, for example, they can be shoulder tip pain, okay. This happens from the diaphragmatic irritation, and this is carried through vagus and phrenic nerve, which are not going to be blocked by the epidurals. In that case, they can be managed by using non steroidal COX inhibitors, giving them regular paracetamol. You could actually have topical lidocaine patch, gabapentinoid. So, supplemental analgesia could be required for pain from other sites as well. So, that is the other expectation that need to be met. So this case was about prevention of persistent post-surgical pain. Again, it involves pre-op preparation, providing them information, educating the patient about the pain, and their expectation, how we're going to manage. Intraoperative, yes, we need to use multimodal analgesia, but we are going to take advantage of regional anesthesia here. Okay, do we put an epidural catheter or do we use a parietal block, erectospinal block, intercostal block? So, okay, we are this will be important part of the management. And post-op management, we need to make sure that the epidural is working fine. If it's not working, we have alternatives to it. Okay. And obviously, this is not a case which is going to discharge. The patient is going to be in the hospital for a few days. And uh, sociocultural things actually don't become as much important uh, till the patient is discharged from the hospital. Uh, in that case, how they're going to manage the pain uh, in the post-operative period their follow-up, their support, all becomes very, very important. The third case is also very important. This, so this is a 70-year-old uh, woman, and she's got a metastatic breast cancer, uh, which has been treated for the last six months. Uh, she uses a transdermal fentanyl patch uh, for her cancer pain, and she is on pretty high doses of fentanyl. So she's on 100 microgram per hour uh, patch every 72 hours. Now she has fell and now actually has got a hip fracture. And uh, a patient was very dissatisfied uh, with the post-operative pain manager. 
management after a breast surgery uh, three months ago. So this is a patient who is on a long-term obit therapy and uh, uh, so there is issues uh, with the way her pain management was in the previous surgery. So what we have is a patient who's had a bad experience in the past and this is a patient who's going to require much higher opioids and this is a surgery which is associated with increased risk of persistent post-surgical pain. So we need to remember that uh, aggressive treatment of post-operative pain is very important. And tolerance to one opiate preparation uh, can lead to tolerance to other opiates as well. So uh, it uh, may be that uh, you need to use other modalities of pain management uh, for this case. So what does chronic exposure of opiates lead to? So there are two things. Uh, one thing is that it can lead to tolerance. In case of tolerance, what we're looking at that the same amount of pain require progressively increased doses to manage the pain. But there is another thing known as the opiate associated uh, hyperalgesia or opiate induced hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia. Now this is an uh, a neuropharmacological phenomena. Okay. So paradoxically, uh, in patients who developed OIH, uh, increasing a dose of opiates only make things worse. And sometimes these two are coexisting in these patients. So you can actually have tolerance as well as, as hyperalgesia can coexist. Okay. That makes management of pain very difficult. Then there are patients who might actually deny abuse of the drugs. So uh, the patient has been told that they only require uh, you know, 100 micrograms of fentanyl per hour, uh, but uh, they may be actually be consuming more than what they have been prescribed. And these patients often actually have coexisting psychiatric problems like depression, anxiety, psychosis, personality disorders. And we know that depression and anxiety are independent predictors of severe post-operative pain. Uh, they are also associated uh, with persistent post-surgical pain. These are risk factors uh, for, for persistent post-surgical pain. So these patients are vulnerable to inadequate post-operative pain control. So what is the anesthesia technique uh, we use? So this is the area where you actually have to individualize. There's no data favoring general or combined anesthesia. And uh, if you look at individual consideration, then most people will likely go for a regional anesthesia technique that know that we, these patients may not behave uh, as we expect, or they may require massive amounts of opiates to control pain. So the expert opinion actually tilts towards regional anesthesia or neuroaxial anesthesia. Okay. Whenever possible. So in this case, there are two goals. One thing is the, to provide effective analgesia, and second is prevent withdrawal. Okay. So in patients uh, who have increased opiate requirement, uh, where do we go? Do we go for GA or go for regional? I've already explained that uh, this is very important. That even if patients actually are having regional anesthesia technique. Uh, we still need to at least provide them the opiate support. Okay. And you can uh, do this. The opiate requirement during surgery is uh, a combination of the daily opiate that dose the patient takes plus the opiate dose that is required for that particular surgical intervention. So for example, if the patient is taking equivalent of uh, say 30 milligrams of morphine daily and you tend to actually use 10 to 20 milligrams of morphine intraoperatively for a hip procedure. That means that daily requ the requirement for this patient is going to be 50 milligrams of morphine. Now that's huge, isn't it? So patient people might be reluctant to use uh, that kind of uh, dosage. And the other thing is to actually use continuous infusion of opiates or, and uh, you know, uh, also use long-acting uh, intravenous opiates for 
uh, managing uh, the pain relief. Then, uh, even if you actually use uh, the regional anesthesia techniques and some amount of multimodal analgesia intraoperatively, uh, the dose requirements in postoperative periods, uh, it might be difficult to catch up. Okay. The recovery staff may be reluctant to administer uh, larger dose of opiates. Uh, you have already used, say, around 50 milligrams of morphine intraoperatively, and you are actually asking the nurses to actually give another 20 milligrams of uh, morphine to the patient. Now, that, that the uh, recovery nurses may not actually be happy to administer. They might actually want you to stay with the patient and actually administer that extra amount of opiates. So individual patient requirements, these are difficult to predict. And even in patients who are on modest dose of opiates, say less than 50 milligrams per day of morphine equivalent before surgery, uh, requirements can be pretty high. So requirement will be 50 milligrams of the uh, morphine plus two to three times the opiate that you would normally use in an opiate knife patient. So say for example, like I said, you use 20 milligrams for hip surgery. That means now you need to actually use uh, almost 40 milligrams, right? So two times, two into 20 or three into 20. So 40 to 60 milligrams uh, over that 50 milligrams. So you need to do 50 uh, plus 90 milligrams of morphine. I, that's a huge amount. Okay. Like uh, regional CA technique, obviously wherever can be used, should be used. And uh, catheter techniques will be very useful. Because here you can actually also use neuro, neuroaxial opiates can also be used. And this will, uh, you know, mean that you can reduce uh, your opiate requirements. Okay. Just because you're using regional and neuroaxial technique does not mean that you cannot use systemic opiates in this case. Okay, these are important that the patient get their uh, usual oral opiates and you need, might need to use additional opiates intraoperatively to prevent opioid withdrawal in these cases. Okay. So opioid withdrawal management is another important part of this uh, post-op management. This can be uh, done by opioid rotation. They use a different kind of opioids uh, from what their patients have been using. Uh, PCA, we normally use say 0.5 to 1 milligram boluses. You might actually use uh, a larger bolus and shorter duration. So you might actually have to uh, change that as well. And again, uh, you can actually change, uh, 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 you can also administer a basal rate on the PCA, so there is a constant amount of infusion of opiates. Uh, so withdrawal from opiates uh, prevention is very, very important, and this needs to be decided in the preoperative period itself. Uh, what opiates are you going to substitute, okay, and if you're going to use the same opiates, how are we going to use? Are you going to use another route? Okay, are you going to go from oral to IV and when you use IV to infusion? So these are actually very important aspects. Now, one drug which actually comes in rescue here is ketamine. And we have known, we have discussed this, that uh, ketamine reduce opiates requirements, both intraoperatively and postoperatively. And these can be used as an infusion uh, and as an opiate spending drug. It also can be used as a bridge uh, till the patient is able to actually take their normal medication orally. Okay. Uh, so, periodically, it's a very good adjunct to use in these patients. So, multimodal analgesia regimens is a combination of non steroidal, paracetamol, gabapentinoids, topical LA. Everything is very, very useful. It's important to understand that we do not use opiate antagonists like naloxone, natrioxone, or mix agonists like buprenorphine or pentagosin because these can precipitate acute withdrawal reaction in patients uh, uh, who are on opiates. So we have to be very, very careful. They can be difficult to manage these patients. When you discharge the patient, you need to actually look at uh, what uh, opiates you're going to prescribe. You need to make sure that these uh, opiates you prescribe are not abused or misused. Okay. And you need to actually appropriately use the non-opioid analgesics as we have discussed. They need to be communication uh, with the physicians who are looking after these patients. Okay. 
and we also need to have a program where we need to taper because we have used much larger doses intraoperatively. How are we going to taper uh, the amount of opiates used intraoperatively? Okay. This patient actually has trans transdermal fentanyl patch. This can be left in place, okay? And um, obviously, uh, this there is a lot of counseling which actually goes on uh, about uh, uh, opiate prescription the post-operative period. The patient might ask that I'm only on 100 microgram uh, patch. Can this go further or when can I actually change it? So that also becomes part of the treatment. Okay. So the last part of the lecture is about opiate-free anesthesia because there are problems with opiate as analgesics in uh, the developing countries. There are questions about procuring, how do you procure them? about legalization and the uh, risk of addiction. Okay. Opiate-based anesthesia has always been the uh, uh, primary part. Uh, using opiates is the important part of using, you know, managing post-operative pain. Uh, so the trial, we know that uh, the uh, muscular amnesia, uh, muscular relaxation, analgesia, this tried everybody knows but if you take away the uh, opiates uh, from this and uh, the muscle relaxant so we can actually have a lot more different uh, methods of using uh, you know the non-opiate agents uh, for managing analgesia in the post-operative period so the social uh, so sorry the solution to this uh, consists of understanding the pain pathway which we have discussed using NMD antagonists like ketamine and magnesium regularly, using alpha-2 agonists as part of your uh, management, uh, using peripheral and neuroaxial blocks to supplement analgesia, and using other agents like regular paracetamol and nosferatu as part of the multimodal analgesia. So we have already discussed about the pathway, how the, uh, you know, the nociception is uh, you know, transmitted uh, through the spinal cord, midbrain, uh, uh, to the thalamus and the uh, cortex and the limbic cortex, sensory and limbic cortex. So we can, at the peripheral part, we can use local anesthetics, we can use paracetamol, anti-inflammatory, COX-2 inhibitors, we can give no blocks, we can use local anesthetic uh, as part of the blocks as well as, as uh, infusion, you can opiates, alpha-2 agonists, and MD receptor antagonists. Uh, centrally, um, opiates uh, are used, but we don't actually have to. Alpha-2 agonists, paracetamol, like I've explained, has got central as well as peripheral effects as well. And NMD receptor antagonists like ketamine and magnesia, fantastic drugs to be used, uh, which have again got uh, peripheral and central effects. So the common drugs, now take away the opiates from all this, you can actually still provide good amount of analgesia. So if you have a surgery that has got both somatic and visceral components, see that's what you can use. So if it's just somatic, regional anesthesia actually works very well. In that case, multimodal analgesia uh, should consist of dexamethasone, daclofenate, magnesium sulfate, paracetamol. Uh, if you want, you can add ketamine to this. You can use uh, dexamethamidine to it as well. Uh, but uh, from our experience, we've seen that these are more than enough. But if there is visceral component as well, so regional anesthesia can be uh, abdominal blocks, parietal block, erectus spinal block, peripheral blocks. Okay, uh, you can actually use any of these blocks. And multimodal analgesia would be a little bit more extensive than if it is purely somatic pain. So dexamethasone, anti-inflammatory, diclofenac, uh, non-steroidal, magnesium sulfate, and lignocaine infusion. Uh, clonidine or dexamethamidine at uh, small doses, uh, paracetamol, and, and small dose of ketamine, uh, which I have not included, is, again, can also be used in this. These are some examples which have used, again, uh, mild pain is easier to treat um, than moderate and severe pain, but combine, combining regional anesthesia technique with simple multimodal analgesia, you can take away opioid. The opioid requirements can be markedly reduced by using regional anesthesia technique and multimodal analgesia. And this is just telling in the uh, in tabular form what we can use like peripheral blocks, intraarticular blocks, 
infiltration of incisions. All these have greater advantages in management of pain. Non uh, opioid systemic analgesics, uh, paracetamol, non steroidals, uh, oral or even rectal, per rectal, uh, you know, non steroidals, uh, gabapentinoids, all are very, very useful. I have also described mixtures like uh, the first mix was tramadol with uh, paracetamol, using low dose tramadol mixed with uh, IV paracetamol, uh, given 15 20 milligrams before. The end of surgery actually works fantastic. Then I described use of another mix, which is basically one gram of paracetamol, in which you use 100 milligrams of lignocaine, 1.5 milligrams per kg, and two grams of magnesium sulfate. This was given 20 minutes before uh, intubations, uh, mainly was uh, meant for that. But it can also be used in uh, simple uh, surgeries, or you can use combination of two. So. Uh, what you do is a mix two, you also actually add uh, tramadol and use it as an infusion. So this is a simple mix. The newer development, like I said, this is a paper which actually came out uh, just this month. And they're talking about fixed dose uh, multimodal combinations. And uh, that says this causes, this is dose convenience because patients are, you know, easy to take one tablet than take multiple tablets and uh, they have greater analgesic efficacy and fewer side effects because you're using uh, multiple doses, uh, drugs in, in smaller doses. And obviously uh, there is opioid sparing effect as well as ease of administration. And these are some of the combinations, some which I have already described along with paracetamol, uh, paracetamol tramadol, paracetamol choline oxycodone. But there are also combinations uh, where non-steroidals have been used with opiate, uh, simply simple opiates, you know, tramadol uh, with diclofenac or uh, dexketoprofen with tramadol or ibuprofen with codeine. Uh, these are other uh, simple uh, premix which are available uh, for management of post-operative analgesia. So given uh, uh, regularly for the 48 to 72 hours, uh, can markedly reduce the requirement for opiates. And these are the common drugs uh, which with doses, I will post them on the group. And uh, this just tells you what doses we can use intraoperatively. Uh, Post-op doses are to be titrated. They're never given as uh, a big bolus. They're always titrated in a small doses. Then we have the other peri Periop analgesic uh, drugs, which are non opiate based. So we have rectal non steroidals like ibuprofen, diclofenac, no, uh, naproxen, all non safes like ibuprofen, diclofenac, IV and safes, diclofenac, ketorolac, and ibuprofen is available in the US as well. Uh, paracetamol can be given rectally, orally, and IV, and the doses again. Uh, are slightly different for IV. So uh, you need to be careful with uh, uh, patients who are less than 10 kgs. Uh, more than 10 kg doses are totally different. Uh, lignocaine, like I said, is a very uh, important drug. At induction, you give one milligram per kg bolus. Intraoperatively, you can use uh, 40 microgram per kg per minute infusion during surgery, then you reduce it to 0.5 to 1 milligram uh, per minute towards the end of surgery and, and then continue it in the full recovery and post-op day one. Uh, the dose is the same. It is uh, continued from 0.5 to 1 milligram uh, per minute and you stop it uh, on the second post-operative day. We have seen that the effect of this drug actually continues. Uh, but it's also important that when you're using lignocaine can infusion that you monitor for the toxic effects and uh, you should actually have uh, the interlipid in case patients develop uh, the uh, yeah, last uh, okay. uh, magnesium sulfate and uh, this is available as 0.5 gram per ml uh, usually uh, 2 ml ampules are you know, so each two mLs contain one gram of four millimoles, and the dose is uh, 50 milligram per kg. So in 70 kg man average, you use 3.5 grams, or three to four ampules, which are equivalent to 12 to 16 millimoles, are slowly infused. You need to be careful uh, because rapid infusion can cause hypotension. 
uh, large doses again can cause hypertension sedation and uh, they can also prolong the neuromuscular blockage so if you're uh, using it larger doses do monitor the neuromuscular blockage okay. uh, this is what I normally use in my cases I have more than 10,000 cases uh, where I have not used single opiate not even uh, fentanyl no fentanyl no morphine uh, using blocks so liver became for blocks peripheral or central blocks and uh, then uh, use uh, diclofenac lidocaine magnesium sulfate ketamine so uh, some uh, you know catapress that is the clonidine and dexamethasone every patient get dexamethasone that's the important ground uh, this is how uh, most of my anesthesia looks like um, you know very stable anesthetics and I tend to use MAC of 0.70.88 in most patients because like I said most of the drugs actually have central effect as well so they have anesthesia sparing effect so not only opiate sparing effect but also anesthesia sparing effect uh, this is a simple, I think, small short surgery where we used uh, dexamethasone paracetamol. They would have also got uh, a bit of uh, magnesium sulfate uh, as well in these cases uh, with IV paracetamol. Uh, this is a case where the patient actually has got uh, severe aortic stenosis. And uh, this is a patient has got CKD as well. You can like the EGFR is only 26 uh, coming for hip surgery. So we have used ferronal block because this patient uh, I think uh, had uh, some other disorder as well. The patient was on anticoagulants and uh, This is uh, the anesthetic chart. You can actually see that uh, We have used dexamethasone. We use ketamine in this. So the induction was uh, with profol and ketamine a uh, patient had hemiarthroplasty and uh, we were using ketamine uh, uh, as infusion as well. So it's a very important uh, in our joint to management of analgesia. So in summary, uh, acute pain need to be managed aggressively. We require uh, preparation. Preparation starts in the preoperative period and the patient need to, you need to align with their patient's expectations. Uh, multimodal analgesia is a key to maximize desirable effects and minimize uh, side effects. Uh, MMA can uh, be provided even if there is no access to opioids. And use of regional anesthesia technique is key to providing multimodal analgesia when opioids are not accessible. And uh, fixed dose multimodal combinations uh, will help further in managing post op pain effectively. And these are some of the newer changes uh, which are coming in. Uh, for post-operative management of pain. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this lecture and uh, we'll see you later.